A most wonderfully warm good evening to you, and it is a wonderfully warm and dry evening. Aren't we not lucky? Welcome to Benary, welcome to the Nuremberg Trials, welcome to Laura Knight, welcome to Sir John, um, and welcome to you all. This is a different type of exhibition from, for Benary. Normally we squeeze as many pictures as we can elegantly, I have to add, onto the walls to make sure that you see as much of the richness of our collection as we possibly can show in our limited space. And this is actually quite different because it centres around two works, which actually then centres around, of course, the great oil painting, which is on permanent display at the Imperial War Museum. And I think in 2023, it's a very, very um, important event or an anniversary for many different reasons. First of all, and most importantly, because there will be inevitably a second Nuremberg, but not Nuremberg, uh, set of trials. We can only hope and pray uh, when eventually the horrors of the Ukrainian war actually uh, come to an end. Um, and the Nuremberg trials was the first international war crimes uh, set of trials that had ever been convened properly. So, so that there is a, a resonance there. And then secondly, because 2023 happens to be 40 years after a very special book was written by Anne and John Tusa, uh, which today is still considered by historians to be the standard book on the Nuremberg trials, out of all the many, many books of which we have invested huge fortunes in buying many of them here um, for you to read. So I, I don't want, to, I, I'm not a historian and I'm not an art historian, but we have the art historian in Sarah McDougall who has curated this exhibition, I think, really very beautifully and stunningly and movingly. And downstairs is an, a further example of the richness of the Benary collection. And mm -hmm. I, I think I said to you only a couple of days ago that whatever exhibition we do, I just get astonished by the richness of our collection. There's no, almost no subject that we can't address mm -hmm really, really thoroughly with depth and sensitivity uh, through our collection. And that's something that London should treasure and make sure that it survives. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for, for curating us beautifully. Uh, and thank you, John, for being our guest of honour. There's nobody more fitting to be the guest of honour tonight than you. So I'm just going to immediately say, please say a few words. Uh, you are the news of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, do shout if you can't hear, but if you can't hear, you know, well, there you are. Um, <laughs> David, thank you very much. I can't tell you what an honour and a pleasure it is to be standing in front of two works which I didn't know uh, existed. I think they are absolutely fantastic and priceless. Um, as preliminaries to the final work, which is an absolute masterpiece, they are treasurable, really, beyond. And uh, whatever you did, David, because it says long-term loan to the Benori collection, and I did say, from whom? And you said, hmm. <laughs> so whatever you did to get them, and actually to bring them into the public is absolutely extraordinary. Congratulations, and this is a great, a great honor. Um, there are just a few uh, thoughts about some of the ideas that you may associate with the Nuremberg Trials. First of all, a, a, a word about the, the author, Anne. Um, she, I suspect, is and will remain for a long time the only person ever to have read all 21 volumes of the transcripts of the trials. And it was that which gave her the basis for uh, the book. Uh, they gave the solid narrative basis. And um, uh, as you say, it's, it's wonderful that it's still in print and still available 40 years after the, the event. Um, first thing, the trial was remarkably quick. It began on the 20th of November 1945, six months, up, not even six months after the war ended, and ended on the 30th of se September 1946. This is fantastic. Um, trials now take years and years and years, and you wonder why. Ju they say justice delayed is justice not, not delivered. And uh, the question 
is, and nobody at the time had any doubt about the quality of the justice shown at the tribunal. Of course, a lot of people beforehand, especially towards the end of the war, said, trial? Trial? Put these people on trial. Both Churchill and Eden said, if any soldier happens to come across a member of the Nazi leadership and they shoot them in a ditch, that's fine. And then people slowly said, you do realize that shooting prisoners of war is itself a crime. Uh, so then the long process of saying, we must put them on trial and we must put them on trial fairly. And I think the great definition of the trial came from the chief American prosecutor, Robert Jackson, who said that four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that is brilliantly summed up and is, is, is true. Now, what sort of justice was it? Well, you'll find many people, not I guess here, who say, well, Goering said it was Victor's justice. Leaving aside the fact that you wouldn't, I think, want to side with Goering, whose ideas of justice ranged from summary execution to other even more brutal things, but there are still people who go around and say, well, Goering said it was Victor's justice. There are various things to add about this. First of all, um, people said in, in the trial, you must remember, this is about criminality and murder. Is it Victor's justice? Of course, because there's an old saying, the people of Winchester hang those that they hold. And if you haven't caught somebody, you can't bring them to justice. There is, incidentally, a rather pleasant common law strand running through this. But all the evidence was Nazi documents. Of course, there were eyewitnesses, and they were powerful, and they were needed for the, as it were, the light and shade of the drama. But it was all documentary evidence. In fact, the chief archivist of the German Foreign Ministry went, he made contact with some of the Allied uh, forces and said, um, do you want some of the official documents? And they said, yes. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll take you there. We buried them in the Hartz Mountains. Mm -hmm. So the chief archivist led them to where this cache of documents was. Something, it was 485 tons of documents. And it wasn't just that the chief archivist did this. They were not short of finding official German archivists who wanted to help in getting the documents into order. Mm. So it was all the evidence was on the basis of documents. Second thing, um, some quite good lawyers, the best that were available, were assigned to defend the uh, uh, defendants. So there was proper to and fro in the uh, in, the, in the courtroom. In fact, the prosecuting team thought that the judges were terribly lenient and let the defendants and the defendants' counsel go on and on and on. They kept on saying, why do we have to sit and listen to this stuff? I mean, it's, it's absolute nonsense. It's not being well done. But the judges said they must have their, say. their say. So there was no sense in which the actual proceedings of the court, I think, were were well, um, anything like summary justice. And there were one or two absolutely outstanding lawyers as well. So the process was, um, in a way, it was extended, but it, it was very, very speedy. They worked very hard, incidentally, and they, 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 they sat for, for many days in the week, which was exhausting stuff. Um, so we never thought, and I don't think people suggest, that the trial itself was anything but, but fair. They finally, they were dealing with four counts. The first one was a common plan or conspiracy to do all these things. This was the American charge. Americans love the conspiracy charge. You get criminals, you get uh, tax 
Brexit, you'll probably get Trump on conspiracy charges. If only. And everybody, I mean, it's not part of the European, let alone the British, the English common law tradition, but the Americans said, you've got to have conspiracy in there. Fine, so that was count one. Count two, crimes against peace, and that was where the word genocide was identified and used for the very first time. Uh, count three, war crimes, including murder. Count four, crimes against humanity, including murder. Don't think anybody was hanged who hadn't been, as it was said, close to the bodies. In the end, it was a murder trial. It had all sorts of other things. But unless they were very, very close to the bodies in the sense of direct involvement, um, they well, may have got sentences, but they were not hanged. On, on the verdicts, on the American conspiracy charge, 14 out of 22 were declared innocent. Nobody believed that the, the charge of conspiracy could actually stick. Didn't matter. Uh, on the other counts, especially genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, most of them, not all, mm. not all. Two were innocent on count three, four weren't even charged on the third count. Count four, four people weren't charged. And in the end, Hess got life, because although he was a revolting man and clearly up to his arms, elbows in criminality and murder. He was in such an awful state. I think they thought they couldn't actually hang somebody who'd been mad for most of the trial or pretended to be mad. Three were actually acquitted. Fritscher, Parpen and Schacht. Fritscher, the journalist, Parpen, the diplomat, Schacht, the banker. I've heard cynics say, how interesting that the journalist, the diplomat and the banker weren't hanged. What does that tell you about society? But you know they were they were they were more removed. Four jail sentences and sixteen were hanged. One of the jail sentences for twenty years was Albert Speer. Anne thought very very strongly that Speer should have been hanged. She thought that Speer charmed people, which he did. And, and a lot of people said, oh, he's, he's, he's quite gentle, isn't he? He's a gentleman who uh, organized mm. forced labor, amongst other things. There was one occasion at one of those dinners when the prosecution team would entertain people from London, elsewhere. And at this dinner, one of the guests, it's a dinner given by the deputy British um, prosecutor, Mervyn Griffiths Jones, yeah. who later prosecuted Lady Chatterley yeah. unsuccessfully. But he was a good criminal prosecutor. And somebody said that at this dinner party, said, but isn't Speer really, you know, quite a quite a gentleman. And Mervyn Griffiths Jones said, wait, I'll show you something. And he went and he opened a drawer and he produced a steel whip. They said this was used in the forced labor program. What sort of gentleman is that? But that was one of Anne's particular uh, uh, feelings and um, he survived however many years he did. So there it was. In the end it was a murder trial, a huge murder trial. Nobody was hanged who hadn't been directly, closely, intimately in killing not just one, not just two, I don't need to say, millions of people. And thereafter, people have said, oh, you know, was it fair, was it just? But here we are, what does everybody now say? Time and time again, they say, ah, what this situation now needs, it needs a Nuremberg. So 1945, 2023, it lives, it lives despite the worst that people can say uh, against it, and it's usually what Goering says. Um, and it is, as you, you, you quote from the, the, the closing words of the book, that when people decide that they want international affairs to be regulated by law, 
rather than by power, the nations would start with an advantage denied to those who set up a tribunal at Nuremberg, they would have a precedent. And that, I think, we're all grateful for. Thank you very much. Oh, John. John, thank you so much. Thank you so much.